Hi, Merry Christmas, Vic Veer here, ENT surgeon. In this video, I'm going to explain a new syndrome for sleep problems, which I sort of invented. It's not really invented, I've identified. Someone reminded me I wasn't inventing something. But I've named this new thing, and I want to explain what it is. And maybe some of you out there will relate to what I'm talking about. There are people out there who, when they have sleep apnea, they wake up the next morning and go, well, I don't know what everyone's worried about. I feel fine. And, but, you know, my partner says I snore and I stop breathing all night, but I don't notice any of it. And there are people out there, however, who are on the other end of the spectrum who say, in the middle of the night, I keep waking up, particularly sort of three or four hours later. And I'm like, wake up with a bit of a jolt. And I just, I'm, you know, I've got real sweat sometimes, or I feel really stressed. Um, and I just can't get back to sleep again for a few minutes maybe uh, you know, half an hour, maybe an hour sometimes. And I just feel so wired. And then after a bit, I sort of relax and then I can fall back to sleep again. And then it all happens again. Sometimes it's not every four hours, sometimes it's every hour. And it's, it seems to wake people up. Now, if you're awake for an hour or so and you can't get back to sleep, normally people would be called, you know, you've got insomnia as well as obstructive sleep apnea, because you do a sleep study on these people and say, you stop breathing multiple times at night, you snore very loudly so it can be heard outside the closed door, you've got obstructive sleep apnea. But because you keep waking up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep again, that's insomnia as well. It's called pomisa or whatever you want to call it. I'll put the name at the bottom here. And so what you should have is treatment for obstructive sleep apnea and your insomnia at the same time, because, you know, they're slightly different things. And that makes sense. And, you know, people often get insomnia, true psychological insomnia, because of their sleep apnea. They're so sort of stressed by the fact that they have obstructive sleep apnea. They worry about going to sleep. Oh, my God, I hope I don't get a, I don't choke. I don't lose so much oxygen. I'm going to get dementia. And I'm so scared of sleeping. And eventually you rob yourself of the little sleep that you have. So not only you're not getting good quality sleep, you lose the quantity as well. And that happens a lot to a lot of people. So Kamisa is a real thing, but what I'm talking about is something very different. What I'm talking about is someone who, instead of just sleeping through all these apneic events, what I mean by apneic events is that they stop breathing, they get a little surge of adrenaline, it wakes them up a little bit, they take this huge breath, and then they fall, start to fall asleep again. Now, when that happens, people just tend to fall asleep again. Most people don't even realize they've woken up 10, 15, 30, 100 times an hour. Uh, yeah, I've seen people over 150 times an hour, they wake up every sort of hour. And so most people said, I've got no recollection of waking up every sort of 45 seconds. That's just madness. Um, but even people who stop breathing 10 times an hour, they don't remember waking up every six minutes or so. So, but there are people out there who, when they get this little adrenaline surge, sometimes it seems to wake them up and they wake up and they're like a bit hot and clammy. Sometimes their heart is racing. They're breathing very fast. Uh, they, they're a bit stressed because adrenaline, oh, I think the Americans call it epinephrine or something. Adrenaline makes you wired. It pumps up your sympathetic system. Um, sympathetic system is... It's like the fight or flight response. You know, you go, all right, I'm all like stressed out. Let's let's fight or, or run as fast as you can. The opposite is called parasympathetic, which happens when you're asleep or resting or just after food and you're just relaxing, watching football on the Saturday TV or something. That is the opposite. And if your sympathetic drive has gone up, your adrenaline has gone up, it wakes people up so they can take a breath and then they drop back down again. Some people, I think, wake up in the middle of the night with a real sort of shuddering, pounding chest because their heart's speaking so much. They're breathing so hard. They're using a lot of their respiratory actions that they wake up and their brain is just full of adrenaline or epinephrine. And they are so sort of wired, so hypervigilant that they find it very hard to go back to sleep again. So it seems to be like this surge of sympathetic drive, this surge of adrenaline that wakes up and refuses to allow them to fall asleep because they're so stressed. And that, you know, it's a bit like trying to fall asleep straight after a car accident. You're, you know, you just had a big car accident, you're worried about you just having died or killed your family. You're not going to just, all oh, right, I'm going to have a little nap now. No one does that. Everyone is like, 
can't believe that just happened and all that sort of stuff. So it doesn't happen in those situations. So some people do wake up in the middle of the night. They're very stressed. They can't breathe and they have to sit at the end of their bed and, and try and get their, you know, um, the heart rate down again. And then they start falling asleep. And then the same thing happens again. And it might be that it happens every four hours in some people. And I see, I've got a lot of emails back from my newsletter. And I can see that some people are saying, well, for me, it seems to happen after four hours and then a few times after that. And that might be because people dream later on in the evening. You're sort of more deep asleep at the start. So those people might be getting really bad apneic attacks during dream sleep because uh, as I've said this before as well, when you're dreaming, particularly when you're lying on your back, all the muscles go a bit loose and you lose all your muscular tone. So everything blocks off your breathing. And so dream state, particularly in some types of blockage, seem to wake people up quite a lot. So often there are people who only have sleep apnea during dreams. So that's the sort of thing that I think can happen in some people. They have this... Um, they, they're they okay for most of the night, but when they get into a dream sleep, that wakes them up. And there's such a such a, a big adrenaline surge to get them out of a dream to wake up that they're sort of stuck with this huge amount of adrenaline in their system. They can't fall asleep again. Now, there, I think there's a big difference between someone who wakes up rather gently and can't get back to sleep again because sort of ruminating about, oh, no, I'm not getting enough sleep. Uh, I hope I don't have insomnia. If I don't sleep now, I'm not going to do well at work the next day. Uh, um, and, you, you know, the anxiety of insomnia, I think, is very different from the huge sympathetic drive and the adrenaline rush that goes through someone that prevents them from going back to sleep again. So one's more psychological and one's more physiological. And I hope you can see the difference. So what I've done is I've tried to separate these two people out because I don't think someone who's getting a terrible adrenaline surge in the middle of the night should be getting sleep hygiene advice or psychological sort of help and how to cope and things like that, which is great for insomnia. I'm not saying it's not. But if you have this, and I've coined it post-apneic because it's after an apneic attack, prolonged, because most people just wake up and go back to sleep again. So post-apneic prolonged arousal syndrome. So that I've called it PAPS or PAPAS, uh, or it's a bit like TAPAS, I guess, but PAPAS. And the idea is that we separate these two types of people out, because right now they're sort of lumped into one thing. And if you're too generalist about what sleep is, what generally happens is that people get clumped into different little silos um, and they, it doesn't really fit in with what they're, they're talking about. So well, that's not really me. I'm not waking up at night and I don't need to like uh, read a book and stuff like that. I'm just wired for a short while and then I fall asleep again. So you see, it's very different because, and I've invented this term, papas, because I want people to realize that you shouldn't be treating all these people with sort of psychological treatments for insomnia. You should be treating them maybe for their obstructive sleep apnea to stop them from getting these things. So for example, if they're on CPAP, you go, well, that's pretty good. You know, most of your apneic attacks are treated, but some aren't, but you know, you're down to about four or five and that's within the normal limits. You should be fine. But if they get really bad apneic attacks, maybe, you know, with REM sleep apnea four or five hours later, and they can't sleep afterwards because they get this huge surge, then maybe we should up the CPAP. And if you look at, um, I think, uh, Lanky Lefty 27, the YouTube channel, which talks about these sorts of things, and also um, the, the Australian guy CPAP reviews and uh, Uncle Nick, these people sometimes keep pushing up the amount of air going into someone's throat in some people because they know they don't want any interruption in their breathing because it keeps them from having this big adrenaline surge. I think I'm not, I'm just, just invented this thing, but I want people to sort of appreciate that there's a difference between someone who's just got insomnia because they're stressed and anxiety and they sort of overthink their sleep compared to people who are physiologically being woken up. When you're talking about treatment options as well, we sometimes say, look, I'm afraid you can't have an implant because of this obstructive sleep apnea implants. 
you can't have an implant purely because you have insomnia. You should get that fixed first. And then maybe, if what I'm saying is true, maybe all these people out there are not being given the treatment they need because they're stuck in CBTI or something like that, which is never going to work for them because they're having adrenaline surges rather than the fact that they're just um, they're getting the normal insomnia type problems. I hope that that difference is clear. It's relatively easy, I think, to see this on a sleep study because when you look at someone's sleep study, you don't just look at the HI, and I've said this hundreds of times, you don't just look at the HI, you look at all the other indices that you see, and you'll see that people's uh, pulse rate shoots up just before they get woken up for an hour or so. You think, hmm, that doesn't look like insomnia. They were asleep, and then this huge uh, surge of pulse and uh, respiration rate, they take really deep breaths. They really take deep breaths as well, not just the speed, but also the effort they're using to breathe. The pulse rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, um, the pulse transit time goes down. So all these things indicate uh, a, a sympathetic drive and the adrenaline rush goes through their system. They wake up and then they're sort of stressed for a long time. Eventually, the adrenaline ekes out of their system and they fall asleep again. So I think it's quite easy to see. If you look at someone with insomnia, they seem to wake up in a more gentle, normal morning type fashion rather than waking up with a sudden surge and uh, and are sort of fighting to keep the adrenaline from, from keeping them awake all night. I think there's a very clear difference in my mind. But the fact is, at the moment, we're clumping the, these people together. And I hope, I really hope that we can sort of Someone, whoever, obviously, than me, um, can look at this and go, yeah, there is a difference. And maybe we should treat these people differently. Maybe with these people, we should treat them more aggressively rather than saying, oh, you just got insomnia, go, go, go and get your CBTI. The other thing is, is my little sort of campaign. <laughs> I'm trying my best to not make sleep apnea as, as easy as possible for doctors to understand. Not because I'm trying to be elitist, only sleep surgeons can do this. I'm worried that I'm worried that there are people out there who are giving us little device like a pulse oximeter. This is your sleep. Your number is 56 or your number is 20. Um, and therefore that's how bad your sleep is. That's how bad your sleep is. Or having a little thing at the end of your chin here and say, oh, this measures all your sleep and will give you all the information you need. And this whole clumping of people and saying, oh, your sleep rating is 20 or something, or you've got a smiley face for last night's sleep, and you just say, oh, I don't feel like a smiley face. And um, I'm trying to get people to understand that sleep is really, really complex. If I had sleep apnea and someone you know very close to age and size or whatever it was next to me had sleep apnea, it's very likely we'd have very different syndromes. I think... I think people are different and I think people respond differently to these blockages in our throats. So a good example of this would be something like upper airway resistance syndrome. I appreciate that lots of people don't believe in it and that, that's fine, but I think I see it in lots of people. I think I see people who wake up, but not so much wake up, they just breathe really hard and work really hard to get their airways through this blocked airway. And I've done videos on upper air resistance syndrome. I'm not going to go through that again. But I'm just thinking maybe this PAPAS thing, this post-apneic prolonged arousal syndrome thing, is happening to some of these people with upper air resistance syndrome. Maybe these people who have the smallest little interference with their breathing, it sets off this big surge in them, which wakes them up, disrupts their breathing. They may not have the terrible insomnia, but it's enough to interfere with their breathing and interfere with their sleep. Maybe that's a component of their problem. So I appreciate I'm sort of creating Venn diagrams over people. And I've said that you can have upper air resistance syndrome and sleep apnea and insomnia on different people, on the same person. It's, I'm not trying to say that uh, charisma doesn't exist. I'm trying to say this is an added bit of detail, which I think is important for people to know, because it identifies certain things. And only when you name things do people start thinking about them. Um, someone said something about you you can't think of something unless you have the language, you have the words to explain this to yourself. You know, if I talk about this, maybe other people may be interested in doing research on this and going, 
maybe for these people, we'll treat them with this and see if it makes a difference. Maybe there's a drug out there that says, hmm, we can try and control these adrenaline surges by just dampening down the sympathetic system just by a little bit, not go crazy, but just calming it down a little bit so you don't get these horrible big spikes in the middle of the night. Maybe beta blockers might help people with obstructive sleep apnea. I don't know. But, you know, there are so many clever people out there that can do this sort of research. And it may be something that we can look into. I think it might help people out there to so that them and their doctors or their physicians can understand each other. So if their doctor has a name for the syndrome that they have, they don't like get, oh, you're a little bit crazy. Maybe you should go to another clinic. I want them to understand that maybe it's just a simple physiological thing out there that is causing this problem. And I think there are loads of different syndromes out there. But I, like I said, I don't want to go crazy with naming everything. But I want to see if this, if you can relate to this kind of stuff. And if you can, put it in the comments and just show everyone that there are people out there with a similar problem. And I hope that you can see that you're not the only one and you're not the only one who's being ignored and all that sort of stuff that infuriates me about medicine at the moment. It's You have to be in this this little bucket if you're not then you're you know you're, you're crazy or something um i'm gonna stop ranting so i'll stop there thank you very much for watching this take care bye-bye